Okay, bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, peace be upon all of you. So I'm going to do a little breakdown here of a audio clip of me teaching some teachers in uh, when I in one of the times I did my training engaging Muslim students in public schools live. This one specifically was done in Columbus, Ohio, in Ohio State in July 2019. Since I've gotten on social media here in the summer of 2021 um, to make people more aware of this work that I do in education and to make Muslims more aware of it and for them to understand it's something that they can and should offer to their kids, teacher, and school for them to take to advance people's uh, understanding about the Muslim community uh, and Islam and uh, the needs of Muslim children and how they can be better served and better honored um, in the school, both in how instruction is done, how the schools are managed, um, and, and also in what is in the curriculum. Some people have asked me if I have any live video of myself doing the trainings, and, and I don't have that because when I would do the trainings, I was actually really focused on protecting people's privacy. I would allow them to submit questions anonymously beforehand, um, and, and, and I didn't want anyone to feel the pressure of being on video there because, number one, talking about religion and religious identity and the interplay of religion in people's lives is a very, very sensitive issue for people. And if you know Western culture and American culture well, it's, it's you know, people usually don't talk about it. But here in this context with, with non-Muslim educators who serve Muslim students in their schools, they know there's a need to talk about it. So that, that was a big reason why they wanted to get in this space. But, for pe to, but, but, but to create an environment, you know, the learning environment you create in any context is very important. So, so one of the challenges that this training meets is that it's been able to create an environment for non-Muslim educators to actually be able to ask the questions they have in, in, in serving Muslim students, but not feel put upon about it, not feel nervous about it. So because of that, I never took video of the training because I didn't want video cameras there putting pressure on people. But I do, I do, I did record the audio of it for this training that I did in, in, in Columbus at Ohio State uh, in July 2019. So, so I posted this on my Instagram. Um, I do have the one picture of it. You can see in the picture that I, I have the training, which I would use that in advertising for, but I was very careful about not putting one's face in the picture. And that's, of course, I, you know, many of you know there's Islamic reasons to do that, but also um, it protects people's privacy. So, so I, I posted two little clips, though they're continuous to one another, of um, me doing the training and talking to non-Muslim teachers. So what I'm going to do here is play those, and I'm going to do a little breakdown of them to dissect for you guys um, the importance of this and just to dissect some things about dynamics of teaching non-Muslims about Islam and about our needs as Muslims. Because it takes a very comprehensive understanding of, of what you're doing and the backgrounds of the people that you're coming to as well. So let's take a listen here. So the second pillar, the second pillar is establishing what is called Salah in Islam. Now this is usually referred to as prayer, Salah. How many times a day do Muslims need to pray? Five, good, so people know that. I'm telling you, 10 years ago, people didn't know that. Getting somewhere. Now, I call it Salah here because the, the five obligatory prayers is called Salah. Praying where you like put your hands in the air or you just call out to God and you ask God to bring you good fortune or to bless people you love or this type of thing. That is also praying, but it has a separate name for it in Islam, which is called Dua, which means like calling out. So du'a you can do just like at any time, sort of any way, you know, calling out for anything. But salah is something that is a really exact liturgical process of worship. Something taught by the Prophet Muhammad goes all the way. Okay, so here, distinguishing salah between salah and du'a. A lot of times when people give presentations about Islam to non-Muslims, they might, you know, they, they will of course mention that we pray five times a day. But making this distinction between salah and dua and explaining it out is something that people don't do a lot of times, but it's really important to do when you're talking to non-Muslims, especially when they have a need, uh, when you need them to accommodate the practice. Why? Because if you come from a Christian background, the, the association that you have the word 
with they you have with the word praying is more like what dua is than it is like what salah is. Now you heard me say that salah is a precise liturgical process. The word liturgy in English means an exact formula of worship that you follow. The word is mostly associated with the worship that is done on Sundays in church by, by, by Christians. So describing the Salah as liturgical, that's an important thing to do when, when, when you talk to non-Muslims and you're setting up their understanding of what the five daily prayers mean. Because they, in order to accommodate it, people, they really need to know the, all the details of Salah, how you do it, when you do it, and how that changes throughout the course of the year and the timing and all this type of stuff. Because if they don't know the details well, they're not, they themselves are not going to be successful in accommodating it, even if they want to. But when they just hear the word praying, non-Muslims, they usually, in their minds, they associate that as being something much more casual than what Salah really is. Because the common association they will have with it is that is that praying is just something you can do uh, at, at any time, maybe in any way. You know, it, it can just be talking to God in your mind. You, you know, outside of the Sunday church service, I'd say probably the most exact sort of prayer times that Christians would have is maybe eating before dinner. They might hold hands as a family or group and pray or, or praying on your knees on your bed before you go to bed. But, but even that, that's not something like so exactly prescribed like the way Salah is in Islam. So, you, you know, even before teaching about the details of what it takes to accommodate the prayers, you, you have to set up this appreciation for the need of that understanding with them and getting to this point of explaining what a precise process the prayer is it is important. It goes all the way back to him. It's something that is really important to Muslims. One, because it's the second pillar, so it's the most important actually action for a Muslim to do, but it's also something that works to bond Muslims together across the world and also through generations because it's a tradition that is constantly passed down. And it has all types of rules with it pertaining to how you do it, when you do it, where you do it, and all this type of stuff. And in the next session, when I go over technicalities, I'll go over that. To, so you understand how it affects students and families who want to do it. <clears throat> you know, just to understand the psychological implications with pray, praying. This is a hadith from the Prophet. He says, the first deed by which a servant will be called to account on the day of resurrection, which is like the day of judgment, is his salah, or his five daily prayers. If it is, if it is complete, he is successful and saved. But if it is defective, he has failed and lost. Now, Islam believes in a day of judgment, which is also called a day of resurrection, meaning a day when all souls will be raised up again and brought before God and judged. And, the prof and on that day, you'll either, either be granted to the good place or the bad place. The bad place is called hell. The good place in Islam is, usually, is called, you'd call it paradise. The word heaven in Islam Heavens refers to the sky and the celestial worlds and the night sky. So heavens are actually something in the current creation that we're in. It's not the good place you want to go to after you die and are judged. But now there's a lot to take away here, and, and I'll pause later and talk more. But just this point about the difference between, uh, you know, Semawat and Jannah in the Quran and Islamic terminology. And, and Sema and Semawat, there are translated in English as heaven or heavens, but they don't refer to the place that you go to if you're granted by Allah's mercy after you die. That's Jannah, which is paradise. Because in, again, in a Christian background, heaven is the place you go to after you die. That's what they more commonly call, call it. Now, this is actually something important to teach to public school teachers, because with, with all the stuff that kids read in public education that comes from Western culture, the word heaven comes up a lot in, in, in a lot of different places. And you will see Muslim kids, they adopt the, the use of the word heaven to, to mean the same thing as Jannah, when it actually doesn't. It doesn't actually mean that, but they get conditioned into doing that in the public school. And again, it's something unwitting 
by the teachers because because they don't know this difference in the Islamic terminology. But once they know this difference, now if they, when they're teaching, they're, you know, they're reading a book by 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 Mark Twain, they're they're, they're reading a book by Shakespeare, they're 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 reading a book by uh, whoever from 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 Western literature, and the use of the word heaven comes up in some way. Now this is this becomes a culturally relevant thing that the teacher can bring up, the fact that different cultures have different terms for what for the for the afterlife for the afterlife and in, in, in their religious in their religious schema and understanding and, and they know specifically the terminology to talk about with, with with Muslim students so it's a little deeper level for a teacher to to take it that way but 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 you have to start building the, this this background knowledge and again you know my training is a good part of it, the part on Islamic beliefs, it's an extended walk through the Hadith of Jibril. So it teaches the basis of Islam. But within that, there's all, there's all these different points to, to bring up to make sure that a clash is not being conditioned within our kids. And this, this is just one small thing. ...are judged. But you see how this Hadith, it makes the prayer the most important thing for that day. Now, Islam is like other, other monotheistic religions where it's, you know, it believes that you have to have its belief in order to be <clears throat> granted into paradise. But it is also part of Islamic belief that a Muslim can go to hell for a time period and be punished there to the extent to which their sins are expiated, the sins they committed and were not forgiven for, and then be sent into paradise. So, you know, a Muslim is taught to, the Quran teaches to always have hope in Allah's promise of salvation, but also to have fear of his punishment of hellfire. And the prayer is really the most important thing, the most important action that a Muslim actually does pertaining to that. And it has all kinds of rules along with it. And what ends up happening with Muslims in the West is there ends up being a sort of direct relationship between the extent to which a prayer is accommodated, the prayer is accommodated in a certain setting, and the likelihood that you will do it. Because if it's not well accommodated, then you have to bother a whole bunch of people and sort of make the arrangements yourself. It becomes a stressful thing, and you don't want to bother people and this type of stuff. So, you know, making the five prayers, in all honesty, it is hard. It's hard for Muslims in the West to do regularly. Very hard. And there is a psychological stress that goes along with that. And this affects... You know, the, the age at which you have to start praying, the age at which all obligations become obligatory in Islam is puberty, when you reach physical puberty. So that can, so the actual age can be different, but when we go over the technicalities, you'll see how it affects um, scheduling and all this type of stuff. And those of you who deal with middle and high school who might need to accommodate it in some situations, we'll go over how to do that. Yes, ma'am. So are you saying that if the child prays four times if he feels like he's no, it's not forever. It's if you miss a prayer, though, that is a sin. For missing the prayer, the way that you expiate for it is by asking God for forgiveness and making it up later. But until you do that, it is a sin. It's a sin. So it doesn't mean condemnation forever. You know, Islam teaches that um, that, that every person... Okay, so stop it here. Lots to break down in this. Now, you heard that teacher asking, so if a child does only four prayers in a day instead of five, like he misses one, does that mean that he or she feels like they're going to be condemned to hell forever. So, you know, the, the, you really see um, the person's Western and Christian bias coming out on this question. And it's okay they have that, and, and I'm glad that this teacher did ask that. So, you know, what, what people in the West uh, tend to do with, with, with religious understanding, and, and when they're forming their understanding about Islam and about Muslims, you know, they and everyone does this with learning, but they they project their own background understanding from their own culture onto us, onto Muslims, and on Islam. So you know, this the, this lady, you know, she clear, and because of the conditioning, they they tend to project re religious extremism on us in a way. And I'm not saying the lady's actually even necessarily projecting it. But they, they te that tends to be a concern for them, you know. And, and I'm not talking about violent religious extremism here. But, you know, the, the background association she has here is with, like, like the, the Puritans and, and, and the Christian fundamentalists who founded America, whose strain of thought 
actually is still very much alive in America in many different Christian circles because there there is a there is Christian theology that teaches uh, uh, that teaches it's it's really a large part of Protestant Christian theology that teaches that one sin is enough to condemn you to hell forever that that, that is taught in 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 Christianity in, in certain sects, especially certain sects that were popular in the founding of America. And, you know, the, and, and then from there, you know, you have to believe that Jesus died for your sins in order to be salvation. And, and, and Christianity just in general, it, it has a lot of teachings that someone is an eternally condemned sinner and there's like nothing they can do, do about it. You know, they have, they have the belief that, you know, Adam eating the apple in paradise uh, made all mankind sinful, and they can never be redeemed from that, and they're and they're born sinful, which of course is different than the belief in Islam. You know, you know, because of this too, uh, Christians and people in the West they tend to be really sensitive and worried about the idea of religious guilt, because they have a whole lot of uh, psychological trauma, if you will, in their own background associated with that. Because because of these because of this kind of extreme teaching about sin, and 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 guilt was a very heavy tool used traditionally in Western society by both Catholics and Protestants. Heavy guilt. So you know what 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 the Western world's living through now is 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 a is a backlash reaction to that, where you have this ultra individualism where where people you, people you know they. They, the, 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 the society decided that all of that religious guilt had some negative impacts. But, you know, so where do you go from there? The way that they've kind of answered it is, well, the opposite, you know, in some, in, to, to some people's thinking, is that the opposite might be, you know, then the opposite is the solution. So, you know, we should just get rid of guilt and everyone should just be able to do what you want, this type of thing. So, you know, when you start teaching that Islam, you, you know, it, it doesn't, fully align with the liberal individualist type tri- type teaching that people take as par for the course in Western society, you know, that, then they have a tendency to start associating it well, you know, so does it go back to that type of religious extremism that they're, extremism that they're familiar with in their own history? And you see that here with this teaching, with, with this lady's concern about kids feeling over guilty. Now, of course, Islam has a more moderate approach to that. And it has a more precise and guided approach to it, but just a matter of teaching out the details. And that's why I'm going to go into talking about here about the, about the, the records on the day of the judgment and the accumulation of good and bad deeds. So this lady, she's asking that out of, out of concern, but you see where the association went with that. Now, if she hadn't had this training, that association is just going to stay there, you know, and, and, and that could easily lead her to the conclusion that, well, if these kids have pressure to practice this religion, then, you know, that's just all that's going to give them is a whole lot of guilt or, or this type of thing. But if she doesn't understand them, but, but giving but her getting the chance to understand the more moderate approach that Islam actually has toward it, towards it, that an authentic understanding of Islam has towards it, then, you, you know, you know, that, that's going to ease her own worry about that for for her kids. And of course, the focus is the focus also gets brought later on to, you know, the importance that, that prayer has in Islam with rectification, with rectification of character. And, and that's something that schools want very much for, for, um, for their kids. And, and deeper in the train, the online train that I have in, in the book, I, I, I relate it to something that is held nowadays to be a good practice in schools, especially elementary school, actually, is giving the kids regular breaks and actually giving them breaks through the day to decompress. And some schools, they even they will even have, lead the kids in doing yoga, which, you know, there's some religious implications of that, whether or not Muslim kids could do that um, for, for Muslim kids. But, you know, we need to say to them, it's like, okay, if you're going to let the kids do yoga, which is traditionally a Hindu practice, and you're going to lead the kids in it. You know, nothing wrong with setting up the environment then to make it easy for Muslim kids to be able to do their prayers has an angel on their right side and an angel on their left side. And the right one records the good deeds, left one records the bad deeds. And on the day of judgment, these two books will be weighed on a scale, and you want the right one to outweigh the left one. And the left one, anything you're forgiven for, will not be on it. 
So it's this ongoing thing. It's this, on, it's this ongoing thing uh, to, to try to get the good deeds higher accumulated. Did I see their hand up? Yes. Yeah, what, what are the times of prayer? So in the next, after we'll break, I have a whole different presentation where I'll go over all the technicalities of it. So, so just to point out there, and I had mentioned earlier, but you see the lady, she really wants to know about the times of the prayers. And she, you know, she, she's realizing the psychological importance of all this. So she wants to get knowing to how, how, how do we actually accommodate it. However, an important way in which I structure the training is separating teaching about the beliefs and teaching about the technicalities. Because cause you have to stay focused with what you're teaching to, to, you know, to, to, to have everything come out the, the way it needs to. So, so you know, preparedness in what you're going to teach is extremely important. And, and I'm able to anticipate that question. So, th so it's important to have reference points to, well, if you have that question, we're going to go here. And that's why it's important to have different materials, such as the course and the book, and, and to have a precise learning continuum set up for everybody. And again, actually, when I get into the tenets of belief, I talk a little bit more about the Day of Judgment, and I reemphasize, and, and I talk to teachers about the importance of talking to kids like life is a test, not in a religious way, but in a general way, and people can understand that. And this teaching about, um, you know, the angels and the books and the recording of deeds, that starts to set that up. And I think Muslims need to understand there's just a few other things to take out of this clip. Number one, starting to talk about angels and, and hellfire and the afterlife and stuff. You know, Western people don't take this as anything crazy or anything like that. Sometimes Muslims are a little nervous about that. They Sometimes they think of the West as being like overly scientific or overly material, and especially in, in America. They, they, they have enough background. They have enough of their own family and cultural and religious background to not think that any of that stuff... It is crazy. And they no doubt have some family members who, who, if not themselves, actually many of them, I know themselves, they, they, they believe in an unseen world and this type of thing. No, no one takes that as to, to be anything crazy. And also, too, actually, um, I should do a video on the surveying that shows that, on average, public school teachers in, um, in, in America, they're actually more religious than the average American. And then, and then America is generally still a religious society as far as what people, as far as whether or not p people believe in God, especially compared to, to Western Europe. You know, and, and just another small thing I, I mentioned in there when I was talking about hellfire. Um, and, 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 you know, you know the concept of um, Muslims being able to go to hell for a time and be expiated and then granted into paradise. That's something that distinguishes it from most Christian belief as well. You know, Christian was usually a little more hard line, a little more black and white of just if you if you believe, especially Protestantism, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins and that he was the Lord and Savior, stuck for Allah, you're going to uh, heaven. If, if you don't believe that, you're going to hell. And it's just black and white. So, so that's an important thing to meet out. You know, I did mention in there how, you know, Islam is still a, a salvation exclusivist religion. Okay, Islam doesn't teach that non-Muslims can go to paradise. And I teach that in every one of my trainings. You know, that's something, too, that a lot of times Muslims are very timid about teaching, uh, uh, um, about teaching non-Muslims. But, you know, again, it's something that they can take fine. They don't see it as anything strange or anything peculiar because they're plenty familiar with their own religious and cultural teachings that teach along lines of the same things. You know, and... There's, it's also, of course, better taken when it's set up where you're explaining things in a clinical fashion. So, so, so it's a depersonalized type of teaching where it's not about what I think about you or what you think about me. It's factual teaching of what Islam is and how that generally interacts in the lives of Muslims. Now, I have another part later on where I talk more explicitly about the relations between uh, Muslims and Ahlul Kitab, the people of the book, and, you know, Christians and Jews. And, and, and how you relate interpersonally to people of different religions. And, and I teach about how Islam has a separate separation between the doctrine beliefs, which are critical, and then how you, how you treat your neighbor, which, of course, involves, uh, you know, giving them their rights and, and, and good manners and generosity and all this type of stuff. And I show the Islamic text for that. So, 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 that's, a whole, so, so that's a whole other thing of how you need to set up a, a precise learning continuum that is going to teach one part and then balance it out with the other part that's taught. 
so they don't so so they don't just go to their negative associations and just overall teaching about how supporting the kids muslim identity is something that's going to support their character maturation and well-being overall so we'll go to the next clip you know uh, soon maybe i'll do it right now but but forthcoming i'll inshallah i'll have a uh, breakdown of another clip that comes shortly after this because i'm starting to talk about the world of the unseen where a teacher asks about a a incident that took place in school where her students or muslim students thought they saw a jinn <laughs> 